The rain that falls outside your window today is the same rain that watered the grounds and filled the streams and rivers millions of years ago during Earth's earliest days. That's right, the rain that was still is. So we're interested in into quantifying that, to seeing how much it changes depending on the environmental conditions. That's because rain, actually water, is vitally important to every living thing on the planet. And water is constantly cycling from earth to sky and back again. So water and stream is important obviously, right, for, for not only the fish and the critters that live in the stream, but also our water supplies. It's called the hydrologic cycle. Let's follow this drop to see what happens. When the little water droplet becomes heavy enough, it falls from the clouds as snow or rain. Some of the water washes over the ground and flows into streams and rivers, and eventually into lakes and even the ocean. It evaporates back into the atmosphere, turning back into a cloud. Water droplets can also fall to earth and soak into the ground, and then be taken up by trees and plants. It's later released into the atmosphere through transpiration. But we're only now beginning to understand the specifics of the hydrologic cycle, thanks in part to the Kuwita Hydrologic Laboratory in western North Carolina. The U.S. Forest Service bought the 5,600-acre forest and set it aside as an experimental forest back in 1934. The primary focus is on rainfall, stream flow, and how the forest uses water. One of the main research tools is a weir. Again, it's called a weir, and this is one of the most precise ways you can use to measure how much water is coming down a stream. A weir resembles a dam, but it's more than that. It's a stream gauging station built across a watershed. 32 weirs are built on various watersheds throughout the Kuwita Basin. So this wall extends all the way down to bedrock and extends all the way into the, the hill slope on one side of the, the stream and you can see it crosses the road and goes into this other uh, hill slope. And so the idea is that you're taking all the water uphill of this weir, whatever's coming down the stream and whatever is moving in the shallow groundwater, and you're forcing that water to come over this, what we call a blade, this opening of the weir. So you're quantifying every bit of water leaving this watershed. You see the, the, the pond up, upstream of the wall. That pond is connected through pipes to a well inside of our gauge house. And so the height of the water inside this well is exactly the same as the height of the water in this pond. So in this well, we have a float sitting on top of that water that's going up and down with the level of the water. And we record that with a time chart um, in the gauge house. And knowing the height of that water and the geometry of this weir, there's been experiments done to, to, re, um, to calculate flow as a function of the height of that water. So it's an equation, statistical equation, that's calculating flow as a function of the height of the water. Measuring stream flow gives a more accurate view of the water flowing through a watershed because rainfall varies over an area. And the weir system allows the watershed to be measured day and night through storm and sunshine. But here we're measuring the height of this water to within one millimeter of its actual value. Readings have been taken every five minutes since 1934. That's roughly 200 million bits of data. And that consistency is important. The strength in what we do here is that we've got continuous measurements from one place over time with the same method. It's very consistent, very robust, and what we've seen over time is not that it's getting, not that our mean is shifting up or down, so it's not getting uniformly wetter or uniformly drier, but our dry years are getting drier and our wet years are getting wetter. The long trend of data shows the Kuwita Basin still receives about the same amount of rain each year it's been getting for the past 80 years. But it also reveals that the dry years are getting drier, which means periods of drought are becoming more common and more severe. It also shows that wet periods are getting wetter, what many people call a torrential downpour with flooding. All of that will affect what plants, trees, and eventually animals live in the forest. 
So we expect in the future as our climate um, becomes more variable and we have more uh, drier and more prolonged droughts um, that we will see some species uh, suffer as a result of that. So our species composition is going to be continuously changing. To understand what those changes mean for the forest, dozens of experiments are studying sap flow in individual trees, soil moisture, and how the mineral content in the soil is changing. This instrument-laden tower measures just how much carbon the forest is taking in and releasing. Uh, the leaves during the daytime are doing photosynthesis, so carbon dioxide enters the leaf, it gets transformed into, um, into a carbohydrate, into sugar, but at the same time those leaves need to metabolize. They're like all of our cells, they basically have a certain cost of doing business, so they're breaking down a certain amount of, of carbon, releasing that back as carbon, carbon dioxide. It takes a long time for these changes to manifest. It takes, especially given the variability we have in rainfall, you have to have a lot of data to be able to uh, tease out a trend. Forests move slowly. It takes a long time for a forest to change, and so you can't do this in 10, 20 years. You have to have a long-term record to do it.